You know, it seems like that for more than just the last decade, every last movie that's come out has been about a superhero. And there's Avengers and Spider-Man and Batman and Aquaman and Batman with Aquaman and Avengers with Spider-Man. And if a movie ever came out that didn't happen to be about a superhero, it was about some guy who did stuff that, well, were fairly super. And those movies, all of those, they made them for a reason. They're the movies we want to watch. They're, they're the kinds of stories that we like to see. All of these, these movies, these stories, they follow a, a pattern that we call the hero's journey. Uh, the pattern of the hero's journey is an ancient uh, storytelling form. It begins with uh, the hero's call to adventure. He sees the need, uh, but he, he refuses to call. He can't answer it. And, and then he meets a mentor, and eventually he chooses to face the challenge, and he faces various tests that come his way. Allies and enemies are defined. And then comes the main conflict and, of course, the victory and finally the return to the good life. That pattern describes not only uh, most of the movies we watch from Star Wars to Lord of the Rings, but it also describes uh, many of the great books that we read from To Kill a Mockingbird to Dune to Homer's Odyssey. And there's just something about the story of a hero overcoming that tends to draw us in. There's something in all of us that wants to be able to, to see ourselves through that lens, to see ourselves as the hero, fearlessly facing danger, overcoming astounding odds in order to win the victory, rescuing others, defeating evil, and securing peace for all. I think God built that desire into us. He certainly calls us to live like that, to, to live courageously. Do you know that over a hundred times, Scripture commands us just simply not to fear, not to live out of fear? Way back in Deuteronomy 31, there in verse 6, as Israel prepares to enter into the promised land, God tells them, be strong and be courageous. Hey, don't be terrified. Don't be afraid. A few thousand years later in John 14, 27, Jesus tells his disciples uh, and not to be troubled or fearful. He says, I, I, I give my peace to you. My peace I give to you. I don't give to you as the world gives. Don't let your hearts be troubled or fearful. Then in Revelation chapter 1, when John meets the risen Savior, there in verse 17, uh, Jesus tells John, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Over and over again, Scripture tells us. You know, I, I think that's part of why we're so attracted to stories of courage and of bravery. We know deep down that that is the sort of life that God has called us to live. And I think that's what makes me absolutely love the handful of verses that make up our text this morning. It's one of my favorite uh, little sections of the Old Testament. So grab your Bible and open up to the end of 2 Samuel, the very end of the book of 2 Samuel. Today we're going to take a look at, at a super short account uh, of two barely mentioned heroes of Scripture a guy named Eliezer and another guy by the name of Shema. So find 2 Samuel 23. We're going to look at verses 8 through 12. Will you do this? Will you stand with me? We stand out of respect for the reading of God's word. I'll read. You can follow along. 2 Samuel 23, beginning in verse 8. It says this. These are the names of David's warriors. Josheb Beshebeth the Tachamanite, was chief of the officers. He wielded his spear against 800 men that he killed at one time. After him, 
Eliezer, son of Dodo, the son of an Ahohite, was among the three warriors with David when they defied the Philistines. The men of Israel retreated in the place where they had gathered for battle. But Eliezer stood his ground and attacked the Philistines until his hand was tired and stuck to his sword. The Lord brought about a great victory that day. Then the troops came back to him, but only to plunder the dead. After him was Shema, the son of Agi, the Hararite. The Philistines had assembled in formation where there was a field full of lentils. The troops fled from the Philistines, but Shema took his stand in the middle of the field, defended it, and struck down the Philistines. So the Lord brought about a great victory. Let's pray. Father, I ask that in the midst of this time, as we look at these just brief pictures of these men, God, that you would use this to stir our hearts to awaken within us that desire for the heroic, for the courageous life. God, I pray that uh, you give us a clarity in, in our thinking and in our perceiving. Uh, God, that we would rightly understand the dynamics that, that are in play here, that we would understand, God, what it is that you have called us to, that we would understand how it is that uh, the, this kind of thing takes place. And God, that we would see what it is that you have called us to in our day and in our time. Stir our hearts in this time, Lord. Pray that you would work, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. No doubt, Eliezer and Shema are, well, they're minor characters in Scripture. Uh, we know almost nothing about them. Uh, there's no origin story. Uh, there's no happily ever after scene. Uh, just these two very brief accounts of their bravery under duress. Uh, these guys appear for a moment. They take their stand and then they're gone. And yet the, their stories in their brief moment in the spotlight have stuck in my head and they, they've penetrated my heart. I know almost nothing about these guys, uh, but what I do know of them, I want for myself. I want to emulate them. I, I want the courage of Eliezer. I want the boldness of Shema. I see in these men uh, guys who are willing to do what it is that God has called them to do, to live their lives the way that God has called us to live our lives. Boldness, courage without fear. You know, this world, this world we live in, it's, it's overrun with fearfulness, isn't it? It seems like these days we're afraid of everything. Safety and risk avoidance seem to have become our absolute highest values. Now, security, caution, good sense, those are good things. You know what they're not? They're not the best things. And when we choose them in place of things like freedom and justice or righteousness, we end up choosing to our own demise. A culture that values safety above all else will not survive for long. And really, the culture that chooses that, it lacks much value even while it does survive. Life is risky. You can't live without encountering some level or another of peril. And nothing of great value is ever gained without embracing at least the possibility of real loss. These days, life presents far more than just the possibility of great loss, doesn't it? Crime, disease, financial instability, election season, nuclear war. Yeah, those are all dangers that are far more than theoretical to our lives. So much so that many of us live our lives in anxiety. But I want you to know that. 
That's not your only choice. Earlier, I quoted several times where God's word calls us to reject fear and to embrace courage. But I want you to understand this. Hey, God doesn't just give us that command within a vacuum. God doesn't just say, hey, listen, the whole fear thing, don't do it. Instead, be courage. It's that simple. Just don't fear. Be courageous. Rather, the Lord gives us reason. He gives us a way forward for rejecting fear and embracing courage. Deuteronomy 31.6 tells uh, the Israelites to be strong and courageous, to not be terrified or to be afraid. But look at the rest of what it says. It tells them why. It tells them why they can do this. He says, for the Lord your God is the one who will go with you. As you head out on this new adventure, as you, as you step into this, this new place that I'm taking you, God says, know that I'm going with you. Know that I will be with you. I will not leave you or abandon you. And I quoted John 14, 27, where Jesus tells his disciples that they can rest in his peace and that they need not fear. But understand this, just a little bit earlier in, in what Jesus was telling his disciples in John 14, there in verse 18, Jesus also assured them, I will not leave you as orphans. I'm coming to you. Hey, don't worry, Jesus says, I will be with you. And in Revelation chapter 1, uh, we read from verse 17 where Jesus tells John not to be afraid. Uh, but there, the rest of verse 17 and into verse 18, he tells him why he doesn't have to be afraid. Uh, Jesus tells John, don't be afraid. Why? Because I am the first and the last. I am the living one. Jesus says, listen, I started this thing. I'm going to wrap this thing up. And I am the very source of life. If you want proof of that, consider the fact that I was dead, but look, now I am alive. And not just temporarily, I am resurrected to eternal life forever and ever. I even hold the keys of death and Hades. See, the, the why behind this command to not be afraid uh, the, the source of our ability to not be afraid, to embrace a courageous life. It, it, it's based on who God is. It's based upon his faithfulness. It's based upon his power. It, it's not about us. Our, our courage doesn't come from uh, some confidence in our own strength. It isn't founded upon an assumption that our, our, our enemy is weak or our circumstances are harmless, because they're not. Our boldness comes from knowing our God and from knowing that we can trust him, it, that, it, that the best thing that we can do is to submit ourselves to him and, in, and, and entrust ourselves to his care. He will care for us as we go about doing that which he has called us to do. The men we just read about, Josheb, Beshebeth, Eliezer, and Shema, they were each called by God to be warriors, to be defenders of Israel. Now, there's no record in Scripture of their calling to this task. Uh, but we do know this, these guys were Israelite men in a time of war. And as such, they were called by God to defend their nation. Uh, there are just certain things for which you don't need a, a unique or a, a special calling. Now, you got to be called by God to lead in worship, called and gifted. But you know what? You don't have to be called by God to worship. We're all called by God to worship. You got to be called and equipped by God to teach. You know what? Every last one of us is called by him to testify to this world as ambassadors for Christ. If you're a husband, you don't need a special invitation from the Lord. You don't need a special calling from God in order to, to know that you are to sacrificially love and serve your wife. 
You don't have to spend any time in prayer asking the Lord if that's what he wants you to do. He's already made that plain, right? So too, these men, they'd been called by God to defend, and to fight, and to set an example of courage and of fearlessness. Well, let's, let's look at verse 8. Josheb Beshebeth, I'm pretty sure his friends called him JB. <laughs> he was the chief officer, and he wielded his spear, get this, against 800 men that he killed at one time. Now, if it seems a bit remarkable to you to think of someone killing 800 enemies with a spear at one time, then you're thinking clearly. Uh, certainly, this does not infer that with one thrust of his spear, the JB shish 800 enemy soldiers. I mean, that'd be a long spear. It doesn't even necessarily mean that he killed them all in one day, but rather in one engagement with the enemy. So uh, from the time when the, uh, the battles first began uh, until uh, they came to a resolution by defeating the enemy, he, over the course of that time, killed 800. Now, that is still incredibly remarkable. I mean, if it wasn't, why would they even have bothered to ridden it down? We should read this, and the question in our minds ought to be, how in the world did he do that? I mean, is that even possible? I mean, there's just, I can't conceive of a way the one guy could just happen to do that. Well, to understand how it is that this took place, we have to keep reading to understand what the dynamic is that's at play. Look there at verse 9. There we see Eliezer, the son of Dodo. And if his friends were anything like mine, they probably called him the son of Dodo. <laughs> he was among the three warriors with David when they defied the Philistines. The men of Israel retreated in the place where they had gathered for battle, but Eliezer stood his ground and attacked the Philistines until his hand was tired and stuck to his sword. So David... And some of his best men are battling the Philistines. Uh, when the enemy gets the upper hand and the, the army of Israel retreats, but not Eliezer. Eliezer stood his ground. He refused to step back. And not only that, while the rest of the army was retreating, he attacked. And there is such a picture here of raw determination. He would not give up. He would not quit. He would not retreat. No matter what anyone else did, notice here, even David himself must have retreated with the army. But not Eliezer. Not that day. Not that man. He kept on fighting. He just held on to his sword, and he kept on swinging. He fought until his hand locked up. He gripped his sword so tight, so long, so intensely uh, that he couldn't relax, not even when the battle was over. Now, I don't know if there's a, a legitimate medical explanation for what took place with his hand or if the Lord just glued his hand to the sword to keep him alive. I don't know. Uh, but the picture here is clear that for, for Eliezer, there was no stopping no matter what. He just kept on doing the one thing that he could do. He just kept swinging his sword, trusting that God would do what only God could do and grant him the victory. And there we see it. Partway through verse 10, we read the Lord brought about a great victory. God came through and he gave faithful, daring Eliezer the victory. You know, I've often heard it said that courage isn't the lack of fear. It's just being willing to do what you have to do despite the fear. You know, that very well may be true. Biblical courage is something even more than that. It's being willing to do what God's told you to do no matter what, even when God is the only one who stands with you. You know, in general, 
not retreating when the rest of your army retreats is a very, very bad idea. It's not a good strategy for staying alive. Unless, of course, you know that God is with you. You know that God is fighting for you. You know that God is telling you to stand. And then if that's the case, you don't need an army. Psalm 31, 24 tells us, be strong. Let your heart be courageous, all you who put your hope in the Lord. And that's key, isn't it? That, that's the key in all of this, is that your hope is in the Lord, not in yourself, not in your abilities, not in your resources. I mean, the, you can go very far astray with this if you try to convince yourself that, that you're doing God's thing when really you're just doing your thing. The rebel's prone to that, to take a stand, but not, not standing with God, standing on your own. It's, it's easy to, to begin to, to put your trust in your own abilities, in your own resources, but that isn't what this is about at all. But rather, the key is putting your hope in the Lord. When your hope is in the Lord, when you're following his lead, you're following him. When you're pursuing his thing, not, not your thing, well, that's when you can know that you can stand. You can know that he is with you. I don't know how Eliezer knew in that moment that God was fighting for him. And maybe the Lord, just in the midst of the battle, spoke so very clearly to him. I know that if it had been me, he would have had to have spoken very, very clearly to me in that moment. Or, you know, maybe, maybe the Lord didn't speak to Eliezer at all in the midst of the battle. Maybe Eliezer was just so focused so committed to doing what he was supposed to be doing, so focused on doing the thing that God had given him to do that he didn't even look up until after he'd killed the last Philistine. And then he kind of looks around, confused, wondering where everybody went. Either way, the key here, the thing for us to notice is that it was the Lord who brought about a great victory. It wasn't Eliezer. Oh, in the way that we think of heroes, Eliezer wasn't really a hero. He wasn't the product of a mad scientist's experiment, God bad. He, he wasn't some sort of a mutant with special powers. He wasn't a billionaire tech genius with a weaponry beyond our imagination. No, he was just a guy. He was just a guy who was willing to follow the Lord wherever the Lord led and to entrust himself to the Lord. And so the Lord used him. It was the Lord who won the victory that day. And it's the Lord who gets the credit. Too often, we see this stuff wrongly. And we begin to think that it's all about us. Or whether it's someone getting a big head when God uses them, or people wrongly of elevating someone who's been used by God, or more commonly, you and I, doubting that God would ever use us because, well, when we look in the mirror, we realize that we're just nothing special. That's wrong thinking. Oh, not the part about us not being something special. Well, we are nothing special in that sense. But God uses those of us who are nothing special. God will use anyone who will put their trust in him, especially us no one specials. And when the Lord does use one of us, it's about him, not about us. Well, verse 11 tells us that after him was Shema. And this guy, this guy is my favorite of the three. Uh, the Philistines had a, assembled in formation where there was a field full of lentils, beans. They're in a field of beans. 
and the troops fled from the Philistines, so the Israelites begin to run away. But Shema took his stand in the middle of the field, defended it, and struck down the Philistines. And so the Lord brought about a great victory. So here we are, a very familiar situation. Israel is facing off with the Philistines, and again, it begins to go badly. And again, someone keeps on fighting. Uh, when everyone else bails out, Shema just can't. He can't. Now, maybe I'm reading too much into this, uh, but I think it's interesting that the text tells us two different times that this all took place in a field of beans. Here's how I see this playing out. Israel and the Philistines are fighting, and once again, the Philistines begin to win. But Shema has had enough. He's had enough. Israel's armies, uh, Israel's enemies often attacked right around harvest time in order to steal their crops. Uh, but Shema was not going to let that happen, at least not with that field of beans. And so he makes his stand. He draws a line in the sand and he decides that he just can't let that happen again. Not these beans, not this time. Okay, maybe it wasn't about the beans, but Shema had had enough. He'd had enough. It just wasn't right what was happening. It wasn't right for the Philistines to keep coming in and stealing their crops. And Shema was going to do something about it. Maybe no one else would, but he had had enough. You know, patience and long suffering, those are, are qualities that Scripture commends to us. But sometimes, Sometimes maybe we mislabel hesitancy and passivity as if it were long-suffering. And sometimes you know, we call it patience when really what it is is a reticence to enter into the battle. There is a time to fight. There is a time to take our stand. There is a time to say enough is enough, is enough, I'm done, I'm done. You and I, there's a time for us to fight. Even when the odds are against us, you know, we're not to be deterred by bad circumstances. <laughs> when God told Joshua to, to take the Israelites into the promised land, the odds were against them, okay? And the circumstances, it did not favor them in any way. But God told Joshua, Joshua chapter 1, verse 9, Haven't I commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Over and over again, God reminds Joshua, be strong, be courageous. Be strong, be courageous. Don't be afraid. Don't get discouraged. But he doesn't just tell him to do that. He tells him why. He gives him a reason to be courageous. He gives him a reason to reject fear. Why? For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. The Lord told Joshua, listen, Joshua, don't worry. Don't worry about the battle plan. Don't get fixated on how high the walls are around that city, how thick they are. Don't... Don't look at the statistics of all the armies that have come against Jericho and failed. No, just follow me. Just do what I've told you to do. Just trust me, and I will fight for you. Many years later, Jesus told Jairus, the synagogue leader, in Mark 5, 36, don't be afraid, only believe. Don't be afraid, Jairus. Just believe me. Believe me. Well, what did Jairus have to be afraid of? I mean, he wasn't facing a battle in front of the city of Jericho. Well, he had a lot to be afraid of, actually. You see, when he had left home that morning, his daughter was near death. He'd gone to, uh, to get Jesus, to bring him, that he might heal his little girl. But now, while well, Jesus was delayed along the side of the road, word comes to Jairus that his little girl has died. But Jesus says to him, Jairus, don't be afraid. 
Don't be afraid. Only believe. Believe me. Jesus told him, listen, don't, don't be thrown off by the circumstances. I told you I will heal your daughter, and I will heal your daughter. And he did. He did because God always does everything that he says he'll do. Now, please, remember, God doesn't always do what we want him to do, does he? But he does always do everything that he says that he'll do. And so you and I, we can put our hope in God. We, we can trust him to do what it is that his word tells us he'll do. And so we don't have to fear our circumstances. And no matter how bad they get, and no matter how bad things are, we can remember this. God is always greater than our circumstances. Always. When things are looking bad, when things are going poorly, the thing to do is to consider what it is that God has promised us. And then our then put our hope in him. We don't have to fear our circumstances. We also don't have to be afraid of people, not even powerful people. Proverbs 29, 25 tells us the fear of man is a snare, it's a trap. But the one who trusts in the Lord is protected. Hebrews 13, 6 tells us, therefore we may boldly say the Lord is my helper. And since the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? You see, when God is working on our behalf, we don't really have to worry about people who oppose us. What are they compared to God? In the end, God always gets his way. Now, that doesn't mean that people won't cause you substantial trouble. They will. In Matthew 10, 28, it, Jesus offers these, well, less than comforting words. He says, don't fear those who kill the body. Oh, just that. Yeah, don't, don't, don't fear them. I don't know about you, but I'm using my body currently. And someone killing my body at this point would be a rather inconvenient thing. But Jesus says, don't fear those who kill the body but are not able to kill the soul but rather fear him, respect him, who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. In other words, Jesus says, hey, listen, don't worry about people because after all, all they can do is kill you. <laughs> okay. And yet, for the saved, for those who belong to Christ, for those whose eternity is secured because of the blood of the lamb, killing your body is not really all that terrible of a threat. I mean, it's like bumping into a guy in a dark alley and he says, watch it, buddy. I'm gonna eject you from this problem infested, pain filled world and I'm gonna deliver you to paradise where all is joy and pleasure and goodness and there's no taxes or elections. It's like, oh, can we do that now? You know, when you begin to see things through that lens, it gives you the kind of boldness that I see in Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Remember them? And not only do they have weird names, they were Daniel's three friends who, who, who had some courage themselves. Uh, when King Nebuchadnezzar commanded them to worship an idol, they refused. They refused to deny their God. So King Nebuchadnezzar had threatened to throw them into a fiery furnace. And how did they answer? How did they answer Daniel chapter 3, verses 16 to 18? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, we don't need to give you an answer to this question, whether or not they will go and worship the idol. If the God we serve exists 
then he can rescue us from the furnace of blazing fire. They're brave, but they don't have a lot of confidence here. If the God we serve exists, then he can rescue us from the furnace of blazing fire. What about will? What about will rescue us? And he can rescue us from the power of you, O king. But even if he does not rescue us, we want you as king to know that we will not serve your gods or worship the gold statue you set up. You see, these three guys, they knew their God, and they knew that he was good, and they knew that they were called to worship him and him alone. But you know what they didn't have? They didn't have a specific promise as to how God was going to handle the situation that they were in. They didn't know how things were going to turn out, but they did know this. They knew that their God was good. They knew that their God was faithful. They knew that their God was just, and they knew that they could entrust themselves to him. And so they tell the king, listen, our God, our God can rescue us. We don't happen to know if he will rescue us or not, but we know that he can, and even if he doesn't, we entrust ourselves to him. That kind of trust, that kind of trusting the Lord, and not trusting in, in, in knowing how God is going to handle something. That, that's a different thing, right? It's like, oh, I can trust God in this situation because I know that God is going to do X, Y, or Z. I know that God is going to handle things this way. But when I put my trust in God saying, you know what? I have no idea what God is going to do in this situation, but I know him, and I know I can trust him. When we trust the Lord like that, without knowing what it is that he's going to do, that enables us to begin to live life the way God has called us to live it. 1 Corinthians chapter 16 there in verses 13 and 14, as Paul wraps up this letter, he says this to the believers there in Corinth, and he would say the same to us. He says, this is what I want you to do. I want you to be alert. And I want you to stand firm in the faith. And I want you to be courageous and be strong. And I want you to do it all in love. You and I. You and I, we need to be paying attention to what's going on. We need to be alert. But we need to know what's going on around us. And, and, and we've got to stand upon the principles of our faith. We've got to live out our lives in a way that is shaped by what we believe. Hey, there, there's a point where we are going to have to say enough is enough. And we're going to stand on what's right. And that's going to take courage. It's going to take strength. It is not going to be easy. And don't miss what it says there at the end. Do everything in love. In the midst of all this talk of courage and boldness, daring and strength, we might be rather prone to just rushing out there and acting like a jerk. That's not what the Lord wants. When we make our stand, when we draw a line in the sand, and there are times when we need to draw a line in the sand and say thus far, no further. When we refuse to surrender one more field of beans to the enemy, we need to do it in love. You know, gentle strength is far more impressive than raging. It's stronger. It's more powerful, more effective, too. A calm, kind, absolutely resolute action, it shows far more strength than an angry rant. You see, when you're not afraid, you don't have to rage. You don't have to lose your mind in the midst of it all. As the Apostle Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy 1.7, he says, God has not given us a spirit of fear, 
but one of power and of love and of sound judgment. Those three go together. And those are to be the markers uh, of the stand that we take, of the line that we draw. You see, the key to it all is finding our life in Christ, is seeing ourselves and defining ourselves as in Christ. Coming to that place where uh, that thing that Paul says in the book of Galatians begins to, to make sense to us and begins to be uh, the way that we see our own life and how we define ourselves. It's there where Paul says, it is no longer I who live, but a Christ who lives in me. When we're in that place where it's not really about me anymore. I, it's not about me pursuing what I want. It's about me pursuing what Christ wants. It's not about me living for myself, but now I live for Christ. When we live from that place, we find ourselves enabled, empowered with a boldness and a courage, a freedom from fear that will shape us radically. You see, as Psalm 27, 1 says, the Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? When the Lord is my light, when the Lord is where I find my salvation, I have no fear. But when the Lord is the stronghold of my life, why should I be in dread of anything? I'm secure. Because you see, when Christ is our everything, we don't have to fear anything. Let's pray. Father, I ask that this morning, as we consider these just so brief pictures of these men who entrusted themselves to you. God, that our hearts would be stirred, would be awakened. God, I pray that, uh, that we would be enabled and empowered and emboldened by you to take a stand, to draw a line, to say thus far and no further. God, to take a stand upon your word, your ways. God, I pray that we would, we would do it with a sound mind, from a heart of love, that we would represent you well, even as we engage in the battle. God, I pray that you would use us. Give us courage. Prayed in Jesus' name.